Hello and a really warm welcome to the first of our national events for Psychological Professions Week 2022. It's a delight to welcome you here today. Um, there have been regional events around the country already yesterday and will be across the week, but today we launch our national programme of events. My name's Adrian Whittington. I'm National Clinical Lead for Psychological Professions working across NHS England and Health Education England. Um, and of course, what we're going to be presenting today is not just my work, but the work of many. And we have a glittering cast of uh, presenters joining me today to, um, to take us through. So if we could go to the first slide, please. So we'll introduce our, our panel and our, um, our speakers as we go through today. Uh, and uh, we would love to hear from you during the session. So um, you can post comments in the right hand side of your uh, screen right now uh, in the Slido window. Uh, if you do have any technical issues, um, then please contact the email address here. We are recording the session. So if you don't want your name to appear, please post anonymously. And at the end of the session, you'll get some more information about how you can access the materials, the recording, and your attendance certificate. So we hope you enjoy. Please also engage through social media and we have um, our hashtags at the top of the screen there for linking through Twitter and other platforms. So it's a great pleasure now to hand over to my colleague, Debbie Riley, who's Director of National Education Programmes at Health Education England. And she's going to kick off the session for us. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all well on uh, such a glorious day as today. I'm sure uh, the weather is atrocious, so it's one of those fantastic opportunities that we're not all having to travel. I'm delighted to be here this morning and to introduce the session and to recognise the psychological uh, professionals. Health Education England vision has always been to help improve the quality of life and health and care services for the population we serve by ensuring the workforce of today and tomorrow has the right skills, values and behaviours in the right numbers at the right time and in the right place. Our commitment continues to work with partners to plan, to recruit, educate and train the workforce of today and tomorrow to be the very best that they can. What a long way the psychological professions have come from relative obscurity uh, in the national systems to recognition and ever increasing inclusion. The psychological professions have come um, and are highly valued part of the workforce. And we know we have to continue to invest and grow at scale if we are to, to deliver the long-term workforce plan ambitions. It's anticipated that this uh, workforce needs to grow significantly, uh, contributing a third of the overall growth required to deliver the mental health workforce growth overall. And Health Education England and partners remain committed to continue to invest and develop this workforce to improve access to psychological health care. The psychological professions play a central role in delivering um, psychological health care as members of multidisciplinary teams and continue to make an impact for the population we serve. I really wanted to take the opportunity this morning to thank you all uh, for the, all the fantastic work you're undertaking across the system, really to lead change no matter what your role and contribution. We know the future will have challenges ahead and psychological uh, professionals will be able to offer solutions which continues to make the NHS a more effective and efficient uh, service provision. So please let's keep talking and working together to improve access, transform lives and create healthy, thriving communities. A big thank you uh, again from me for all the work that you're undertaking. I hope that you're going to have a fabulous week um, and I look forward to uh, continuing to see the progression of this uh, professional workforce going forward. Thank you very much. Back to you, Adrian. 
Thank you so much, Debbie, for that really warm and positive welcome to the session. I really appreciate those words. Thank you. So this session is entitled What Next for the Psychological Professions? Realising Our Vision. And this is the plan for the rest of the time we have today. I'm going to be talking about our psychological professions vision. I'm going to be looking with uh, help from others at so what? What does this mean in terms of making a difference? And then I'm going to come on to um, share with you detail around the psychological professions workforce plan and uh, attempt to answer the questions, where are we now and what next? And um, I, th I hope that by the end of the session, you'll have a sense that we have come a long way, as Debbie said. Um, we've still got a long way to go and a lot more that we can offer and we can offer some solutions even at times of challenge and difficulty. So why do we need a vision for the psychological professions and, and a shared way forward? Well, we need a more psychological NHS. These are the reasons uh, for that. It's what the public consistently tell us that they want. Um, there's great evidence for effectiveness of psychological interventions. Providing a more psychologically based service can drive cost efficiency. So at a time of cost pressure, this is a good thing to be investing in. And yet we know that most people who could benefit from a psychological way of working in whichever part of the service they are uh, currently can't access such a service. Um, and we have a NHS long term plan now that demands a solution to this uh, a policy framework that demands a solution and a really significant growth in um, in our offer of psychological interventions. So one of the things that we uh, undertook to do uh, in the last couple of years is develop a shared direction through which together as psychological professionals, we might progress to make the maximum impact that we can for the public. And people will recall who've been engaged in this work for the last couple of years. Uh, in 2020, we launched a psychological professions into action program and we collected responses from several thousand people um, across a period of time uh, to help shape our commitments to how we move forward together. A really important process because it's enabled us to come together with a co-produced sense of direction, a shared set of goals. So this was the result. Many of you will be familiar with this. And this vision is all about making a more psychological NHS and maximizing the impact of these psychological professions, these particular groups for the public. So our mission is to transform lives and communities by extending and embedding psychological knowledge and practice across the whole of health and care. So a really ambitious uh, mission. And within this, we have five areas of commitment. They're represented here as planets. Um, and these commitments uh, have more detailed uh, elements beneath them if you want to um, access those through the Psychological Professions Network website. So the first commitment area is put people first, help our communities to thrive, make all health and care psychological, transform and innovate, and unite and increase diversity in the psychological professions. I'm going to say a bit more about these commitments in a minute, but first I wanted to um, ask some experts by experience of using um, services, why they thought this vision was important. Um, and we'll just go to that recording now. Well, thank you so much for joining me to have this conversation today. I just wonder if um, each of you might like to introduce yourselves briefly. I'll come to you first, Amy. Hello, my name's Amy Chidley and I work predominantly in uh, perinatal mental health services uh, locally and nationally. And Alison? Hi, I'm Alison Bryant. I'm a service user and a member of Lexi, Liverpool Experts by Experience, a service user group that support the DCLIN at Liverpool University with their lived experience. Hi. And Josh? Hello, uh, my name is Josh. I live and work in East Sussex as an expert by experience working with young people. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining me. So uh, we, we're going to just run through three questions uh, to really try and answer that question. So what about this vision? Um, so you've seen the commitments of the psychological professions vision. 
Can I first ask uh, each of you, have you seen these commitments in action? Um, shall I speak first? Hi. Um, I think really for me, the, um, the vision commitments um, have been seen by me particularly as they relate to the individual and the person, the family and the carers by a clinical psychologist who really embodied that vision in the way that she um, allowed herself to, with compassion, empathy and insight, um, be able to explore different strategies and different ways of putting together how my presentation at the time um, could be helped across the breadth of her skill set. And that was looking at me as an individual, looking at my health, by that I my physical and my mental health, which were extremely poor at the time, and to be able to explore and find new ways to engage me in life when I had very little hope, um, to explore not only just through the Therapeutic Alliance, but actually expanding on that. How could my life and my outcomes be better as a result of my re building a relationship with her in therapy? And really, um, I can say in so many different ways, um, I was able to empower myself. My family, my husband were empowered too through her input and across my physical health, she also explored ways of me to manage a long-term physical health condition um, using her insight, which really is, is embodied within that vision to reach across to other health professionals to be able to make my journey through preparing for complex surgery, um, basically to alleviate anxiety, to inform with broader knowledge and also to share broader psychological knowledge with me, which allowed me to um, cope with that particular period of my life. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that experience. Does that uh, chime for uh, you, Amy? or you? Yeah, Jeff? yeah, I'm, I'm nodding because um, similarly, um, I've, I've always found it strange when you know, the psychological and the physical are separated. Um, and for me, with an, an underlying physical condition um, and doctors perhaps not understanding that, so it's quite a rare condition, um, and feeling that quite often things were put down to psychological problems. Um, and the, the, the relationship is very, very complex. Um, but it is when it is when they look at you as a whole, listen to the person and not the, the label, the diagnosis. Um, I'm Amy, I'm not a person with Alexander syndrome or a depressed person, I'm Amy. And um, when I was very poorly postnatally, um, it was when people started asking me about who I was, what my interests were. Uh, and again, the psychologists looking at the things that would help me to grow as a person as I came out of, of that really dark time. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah, and that the commitment to, to the person um is is the huge things and i think um i mean very the, the the logo for this this thing being a rocket i would say well it's not rocket science actually <laughs> it's about humanity isn't it and and uh, dignity and treating somebody or looking at somebody and seeing them as as precious and individual and worth worth fighting for um i think that's what healthcare is about it's got kindness and compassion and, and making that that work and um the people who are in a psychological profession hopefully are in it for that reason and um, so if if you're a human being you're going to be a good psychologist yeah, you've really described there i think what it means to put people first mm. and uh, and really understand what it means to be to be human and have those human needs how, how about you josh have you have uh, you seen these vision commitments in action yeah definitely um i'd say more on the mental health side than uh, physical health. When I first started accessing children's mental health services about 10 years ago, I wasn't actually there that long. I only had about three or four sessions. Um, 
but at the same time I saw a poster on the wall for a young people's participation group and that kind of kick-started a, a journey for me of working with all these various different groups of people um, not so much in in a kind of clinical or therapeutic sense but um, very much focused on on youth voice um, on on young people's participation I've been involved with co-production um, basically giving young people equal say and and letting them have a voice in their care and I, I turned up to a group 10 years ago I still keep turning up today and um, yeah, it's, it's it's been a real journey for me and that would never have happened if um, the the professionals I'd worked with had, hadn't been committed to to that vision. That's They're really, really committed to bringing your voice in and um, helping you to sort of drive what care needs to look like. That's right. Yeah. Knowing that they have influence in, in the direction of their care and that um, you know the decisions can be shared decisions it's it's not so much about having things done to you but it's um about having decisions made with you thank you so much to uh, amy ali and josh for sharing your experiences i think that does really help us to put into context why it's so important to hold on to the commitments that we have collectively arrived at so I'm just going to explore those commitments a little bit further so that um, we can understand those together and, and uh, be starting from the same place. And I'm going to be asking for a bit of uh, participation during this and an opportunity for um, those in the audience today to share their experiences within Slido. Uh, and I'll explain a bit more about that. Um, but also, if you have any questions for um, Amy, Josh or Ali, they're going to be joining us in the panel discussion at the end of the session. So please do post those into Slido as well. So what's Put People First all about? Well, the commitment is to commit to putting the needs and voices of people at the heart of everything we do and to treating service users, carers, families and staff with kindness, empathy, openness, respect and dignity. I think the invitation here is for us to continue to commit to put people first, even when times might be tough in the services that we work in. Um, because without that, I think um, it, it will be hard to discern our priorities. I'm going to, uh, a, a couple of years ago, when we first presented the findings of um, psychological professions into action, we, we asked members of the audience to post into Slido what they planned to do uh, in relation to each of the commitments. And today I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different, which is to tell us about something that you have done that aligns to each of the commitments. So into Slido, if you could just type hashtag people and then one action that you've taken in relation to put people first, perhaps in the last year. And uh, we'll really look forward to seeing what people share. So hashtag people, then one action that you've taken. And we'll let the, that stream of, of uh, comments come through over time. I'll move on now to our next commitment. So then the next one is help our communities to thrive. We commit to developing healthy, thriving communities with a more psychologically informed public. And I, I think the invitation here is for us to continue to reach out, even as I say, when there might be pressures how do we continue to engage in new and uh, effective ways with the communities that we serve? And again, I'd like to invite you to share in the Slido today uh, one action that you might have taken in relation to this, something that perhaps others could benefit from hearing about. Um, so if you can type hashtag communities on this one, and then one action that you've taken perhaps in the last year that aligns to this commitment, We'll look forward to seeing what comes through. So our third commitment area is make all health and care psychological. This states we commit to embedding psychological knowledge and practice across the health and care system so it's better able to meet all of a person's needs 
psychological, physical and social. So this really is a the, the sort of big frontier ahead of us. Obviously, psychological professionals are working across uh, the whole of healthcare, but there's so much more that could be done. And I do think that if we can really um, cross this frontier in a um, expansive and ambitious way, this gives us a great way of helping to address some of the challenges that we might face. So on this one, if you would like to share something that you've done in the last year relating to this, please type hashtag psychological and then one action that you've taken over this past period in relation to this. What have you done that might have contributed in some small way even to making all health and care psychological? So the next one is unite and increase diversity in the psychological professions. We commit to the psychological professions becoming a united force. This has been a really important um, move forward for us with a strong and diverse voice working collaboratively with other professionals of all disciplines. So this one's about uniting as a set of disciplines, but it's also about having diverse voices within those disciplines um, and in inclusion of people from a whole diversity of backgrounds. So the invitation here, I think, is for us to continue the focus on this work. We know we've got further to go, but I think as you'll see, uh, as I go through some of the remainder of my um, talk later, we have made progress. On this one, it would be wonderful to hear from you um, on any action that you've taken in relation to this. And if you would like to type hashtag diversity and then one action you've taken on this into the uh, Slido, please. That would be amazing. And finally, transform and innovate. We commit to using our evidence and expertise boldly to innovate and improve what we do. So I think this is about us needing to innovate. We need to not stand still uh, and we need this to be aligned to evidence. Um, and, and this will involve being bold. It's a time when innovation is going to be even more important, I think, um, to develop new ways of working. So perhaps share with us, if you can, something that you've done in relation to transforming and innovating in the last year or so type hashtag innovate into the Slido and then tell us uh, any more that you would like to about that. Fantastic. So I can see that those are starting to come through in the Slido now. We really look forward to seeing all of those um, uh, actions and we'll certainly take those away and, uh, and have a good study of those um, uh, in the team as well. Now, uh, that was the pretty picture version of the vision. There's also a document version of the vision. You can download this from the Psychological Professions Network website. And this also went through a sort of public formal consultation program led by NHS England. Um, so the, the final result is in this paper and in the a set of infographics that uh, I think you'll be seeing details of shared in the Slido also. But the big question really uh, on all of this, I think, is so what? We know that visions, strategies can gather dust on a shelf. They might not actually translate into the reality of people's lives. And we want this one to be different. Um, so how might it be different? Well, how might it not be a dusty document? I think that comes down to us together. How can we work as a network, as a set of interrelated agents who are all contributing to delivering on these commitments? Together, I think we have enormous strength. Um, and by working together, that psychological professionals, the public and policymakers, I think we can make a huge difference through enacting these commitments. I'm going to uh, share with now um, news of a new um, resource that's going to be launching next year that relates to this. How can we put all of this into action? And this is called the Intergalactic Bridge. So we don't want these planets to be up in the higher uh, reaches of the universe somewhere. We need to bring them down to Earth. This needs to be about making those commitments a reality and demonstrating that in order that we can demonstrate our value. And um, so uh, one step towards this that we've taken is to uh, put out a call for anyone who would like to share 
uh, details of projects or innovations or work that they've been doing in the psychological professions um, in relation to these commitments to do so by making a short video. And so those videos will be launched on a specific platform on the PPN website during next year. But in the meantime, I'm now going to show you a very brief trailer that picks up some of those uh, components of what people will be telling us about when that's launched. Okay, so my name is Sabiha Asni and I'm the Head of Psychological Services. Hi, uh, my name is Shiva and I am a trainee clinical psychologist currently at University of Hertfordshire. Um, and our project that we have been uh, working on together is uh, part of the planet around uh, uniting and increasing diversity in our profession. We've known for some time that um, improving um, and, and certainly looking at equality and diversity issues and inclusion within the psychological professions has been a challenge for the profession for some time. I'm, and I was interested particularly in terms of thinking about um, what that means for our organisation, the, the organisation that I work in and the services that we deliver. Um, and I was particularly thinking about the different layers of work that we would need to be undertaking in order to ensure that we have uh, a more diverse and an inclusive service um, that meets the needs of the communities that we serve. Hello, I'm Laura. I'm Joanne. I'm Claire. I'm Amy. I'm Claire. I'm Lewis, and together we are the Care and Wellbeing Service. The Care Home Wellbeing Service was commissioned in October 2020 in direct response to the COVID 19 pandemic. As a clinical psychologist who's worked in care home liaison for the last decade, I observed the devastating impact of the pandemic on care homes and made a successful bid to fund a service which could improve the well-being and residents of staff in care homes and support recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Every year, three quarters of the people who take their own lives are men. Sons, husbands, brothers, other family members and friends. Many of our lives have been affected by the suicides of those dear to us. Most can imagine the suffering involved, both for those who see this as a solution to their distress and for those who are left behind. My name's Dale Huey. I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and work as the PPN Leadership Fellow and Clinical Lead for IAP across Greater Manchester. In terms of inequitable access, the elephant in the room over my 28 years working in talk and therapy services has been consistent lower access by men. Around a third of the people using such services are male in comparison to around half of the populations we serve. We know from other projects that promote and targeted self-referral can increase access from traditionally underrepresented groups. A GM commissioning colleague, Chris Pimlott, and I have been working with Greater Sport and professional sports clubs across Greater Manchester to positively promote talk and therapy and reach men that via a different route. I'm Dr Liz Jenkinson, health psychologist at UE Bristol and NHS Health Education England. Health psychologists are ideally placed to drive a vision of making all health and care psychological. We use psychological science to promote health, prevent illness, optimise treatment and improve healthcare systems. However, health psychology approaches and expertise are currently underutilised in the NHS in England, with very few training places and posts. The new project I'm co-directing at HEE fulfils two aims. To use health psychology to build capability and capacity in workforce redesign within NHS systems and to do this through training seven health psychologists over two years, one based in each of the NHS regions in England. I'm Sarah Powell, clinical psychologist and also clinical lead for Sign Health and we cover England in, a, uh, in terms of the IAP service for deaf people. Tell me about the challenge that you noticed in delivering IAPT therapy to deaf clients. It's 
So it's very important that we follow IAP processes because we need to show evidence that it's worked well and, and managing depression and anxiety for deaf clients. But we have had to make uh, modifications to some of the materials and resources because obviously they weren't produced in sign language. In, for example, the homework and the self-help guides, they weren't produced in sign language. So we've had to make videos and uh, with subtitles on in order for deaf people to access them in their own language. Hi, my name is Annabelle Sanders. I'm a senior PWP at Sunderland Psychological Wellbeing Service. Our clients, past and present, have demonstrated great strength and honesty in accessing support and making progress with their recovery journey. They represent a community of great ideas, skills and resources, and we felt there was a gap in that their voices weren't heard with the delivery and the development of the service. Myself and my colleague, Andrew Walton, um, one of our community psychiatric nurses, we came together to set up a service user engagement group. Hello, my name is Matt. I'm a CBT therapist and I work for an early intervention psychosis team in Plymouth and I'd like to talk to you about something called Hello Psychology and Hello CBT. And what this is, this is an introduction to psychology and introduction to CBT that we offer to anyone who's open to our team. It may be one or two sessions in length and it's an opportunity for us to begin to hear someone's story and also to think about how psychology, how CBT may be able to help. One piece of advice that I would give is that it can be done. Yes, certainly. There are a lot of challenges along the way in setting up a service like that. Access requirements, barriers and all of those things do exist. But with the right support and the right changes and, and um, the, the hard work, it can be done. Thank you so much for uh, all of those contributions and there will be many more in the uh, resource that is released um, hopefully early in the new year. And I think it really demonstrates how um, as practitioners, psychological professionals are contributing an enormous amount to the development of uh, health and care services and in a way that is aligned to this united way forward. So thank you very much for that. If anyone was affected by any of the issues that were raised in um, in that trailer, then uh, please do reach out to a friend or colleague. And um, I think there'll be some more sort of uh, resources in, uh, in relation to that posted into the Slido. So I'm going to use the remainder of my time uh, speaking with you uh, this morning to focus on uh, where we've got to and what might be coming next. And I'm going to organise this around the Psychological Professions Workforce Plan, which was published by Health Education England in December of last year. It's the first time we've had a Psychological Professions Workforce Plan at national level. So this is a very exciting framework that we've been um, organising ourselves around. And in terms of who this relates to, it's a pleasure today to share with you uh, for the first time, a revised version of our taxonomy, our list of psychological professions. And you'll see that we are grouped into three broad categories, psychologists, psychological therapists, and psychological practitioners. But whereas we set out about three years ago with a grouping of 12 occupations, we see that there are now 20 in this latest version. And this reflects the fact that there have been a number of new roles developed that we've also um, uh, identified that there were groups that weren't included, where it is helpful to include. Um, and I'm going to just say a particular word about art, drama and music therapists, a particular case, um, who remain uh, under the allied health professions, professional leadership at regional and national level. But uh, we have included in the psychological therapists component of, of this because um, art, drama and music therapists occupy really both homes. They often identify as both allied health professionals and psychological professionals. And we think across the psychological professions and AHP leadership that they can have the best of both worlds through collaboration. Why not? Um, so we're committed to that working together to ensure that these professions thrive. The 
art drama and music therapists can join regional psychological professions networks, uh, but they'll continue to be represented nationally and regionally by allied health professions leadership. And for absolute clarity, all of the other psychological professions continue to be represented nationally and regionally by the psychological professions leadership. So uh, I hope you'll um, agree with me, this is a very exciting development. So where did we start out from? Well, this is a baseline for the psychological professions workforce, which was in March 2020. And um, this shows approximately 17,000 across what we had then, which was the 12 groups um, that were in the list. And you'll see the large orange section of the pie here is clinical psychologists. And other big groups are the green section, which is psychological well-being, uh, sorry, uh, CBT therapists, cognitive behavioral therapists, and the black section, which is psychological well-being practitioners. Um, if you'd had a pie chart like this in 20, 2007, I estimate that about 90% of the pie would be orange. And so we've really um, developed in a very significant way over the last 15 years, a much more diverse set of occupations within the psychological professions um, and clinical psychologists playing a part alongside many others. And the growth requirement that uh, was estimated, and this is an indicative growth requirement estimated as part of the mental health implementation plan, which was published as a way of trying to understand the workforce needs to deliver the long term plan commitments. And you'll see here uh, across a number of areas of specific sort of growth for particular care pathways, very large numbers of psychological professionals being estimated to be required to deliver the commitments of long term plan. And if you add all of these different areas up across the different psychological professions um, and you add in the um, education mental health practitioners as part of the mental health support teams, the total growth requirement by 2024 was estimated as about 10 and a half thousand. So this represents a 60% growth in where we are, were in 2020, a really very ambitious and challenging um, trajectory. And this is what that trajectory looks like. It's a, clearly an acceleration on the growth that has been happening over the past um, 12, 13 years anyway. 2007, going back before IAPT was launched, uh, we had about seven or 8,000 psychological professionals in the system. By 2024, if we're to live up to these commitments, we'll need about 27,000. So how are we gonna do this? Well only through a system-wide approach. It's the only way we can is through collaboration across a whole range of different uh, parts of the system, different organizations. So it will be down to employers working together with now integrated care boards, with Health Education England and NHS England, supported by the Department of Health and Social Care and higher education institutes will also play a really important part. No single organization here holds all the levers to make it happen. And it's only by working together that we can. And the areas that I think we'll need to work together on are set out in the workforce plan, and they are these. So yes, we need to grow. Um, how do we need to support that growth? Well, through developing our professions so that there are clear career paths, there are development opportunities for all, by diversifying, attracting and retaining people of talent from all different backgrounds, by ensuring the right leadership is in place at all levels of the system, and by transforming, embracing those new ways of working so that we can push all of this forward in a very um, sort of tight timescale. But there, of course, are significant challenges. And one of those uh, that I probably don't need to even mention is financial. We know that there are some really tough times that may be ahead of us in terms of um, financial pressure. Um, of course, that's a time when we're in a period of COVID recovery and elective recovery and services. Um, and we have an aging population that means the rate of long term conditions being presented in the NHS is higher than it's ever been. At the same time, we have a workforce that is under significant pressure. And at times such as this, I think there is a risk that culture reverts to one in which psychological ways of working are seen as a additional luxury that can't be afforded. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. Because I actually think the Converse is true, that 
at times like this, this is when we need psychological ways of working. They can not just maintain and enhance quality, they can reduce the pressures and costs in the system too. So I'm going to run through each of those five areas and uh, say a little bit about where I think we are and then where we might be going next. So the first of these is obviously grow. Um, and uh, just highlighting here some of the significant areas of growth that we have been able to track and report on. So uh, improving access to psychological therapy services. These are the services for um, psychological therapies for anxiety and depression. Uh, we've seen the workforce in these services grow by uh, 2,700. That's a 38% growth over the period. Children and young people's mental health also has grown its psychological professions workforce really significantly over this period. Um, and we now see a number of other areas of expanded training commissioning that when linked to expanding posts can contribute to a wider uh, impact too. So we've commissioned over 500 places for nice um, recommended psychological therapies for severe mental health problems. Uh, we've expanded the clinical psychology training intakes by 90% um, and some other sort of parallel developments listed there too. So some really significant uh, growth is happening. What do we need to do next? Well, of course, we need to keep our focus on that 60% growth that we described earlier um, from 2019 to 2024, trying to do everything we can to achieve that. This is a moment of opportunity. We need to track progress with that. I've described where we have been able to track progress, but we're about to embark on a broader tracking of progress uh, on psychological professions workforce through an annual benchmarking survey that goes beyond IAPT and children and people's mental health and tracks uh, growth in a much wider set of areas. At the moment, there's a, a process underway to um, draft a long term workforce strategy for the NHS. We're involved in that. There's modelling going into that about further expansion requirements to 2033. So this is a positive development and we need to ensure that the psychological professions are appropriately included and considered. Um, and that will include growth for the psychological professions in working across mental and physical health pathways. So not just mental health, but in a more integrated way. And at the same time, it's no use just um, doing more to attract more people in. We need to do more to make, the, make um, it more likely that people want to stay um, and be part of uh, be part of the longer term uh, delivery. So focus on retention is going to be increasingly important. So moving on to develop, this is about developing those sort of more um, uh, consistent and um, fair career pathways. Uh, so these are some of the things that we focused on and achieved. So we we have um, established. Uh, across this period, the continuation of the full funding of clinical psychology and child and adolescent psychotherapy fees and salaries. We've also worked with the um, training communities providing those programs to ensure that they really are aligned to the priorities set out in the long term plan in a way that can be demonstrated and um, uh, can help to demonstrate value so that that investment continues to flow. We've expanded NICE compliant therapies curricula, 11 new ones, I think, in the last two years uh, for severe mental health problems and also across perinatal mental health. Um, and uh, people will be aware of the, uh, the introduction of a managed career pathway through the two-year rule for um, progression from one uh, funded training to another. And the development of uh, senior roles for psychological practitioners coming into focus and the, one of those that's going to be launched very soon is the Senior Wellbeing Practitioner for Children and Young People, where the curriculum is now uh, entering its final stages of development. So where next? Well, uh, I think there's still a lot more to do uh, on Career Pathway. And um, one of the areas that I think does deserve greater focus is how could we remove the widespread experience of the wilderness years um, after graduating from a psychology degree. We know that lots of psychology graduates would like to work in health and care, but at the moment, um, there's not a sort of straightforward way of um, uh, managing that recruitment process. 
uh, and people will often be sort of looking for different forms of experience to gain gain experience in order to apply for something. I think we need to make that whole process of recruitment much more straightforward into roles that are that are um, that we're needing to expand. There's more to do on widening participation too, though. This isn't actually all going to be about psychology graduates. It's going to be about a full range of talents, including other graduates and non-graduates who can enter some of our roles. And so pushing on widening participation is going to be really important so that we tap into those groups and make the psychological professions a really welcoming place, uh, whatever your background. And uh, the senior role progression opportunities, I think, uh, need to be developed across all of our occupations. So there need to be routes to progress whatever the occupation you enter the psychological professions with, not necessarily by progressing onto another role. How can we create those pathways so that psychological therapists and psychological practitioners can um, seek and gain promotion and move on and up through the uh, workforce? And um, that will involve reviewing our sort of pathways for progression also onto psychological therapy trainings. And we know that this is a very complex structure of different roles that we have. How can we make that easier to understand and navigate? A lot more for us to do. So moving on to lead, which is the third of the areas. Uh, this is where we are now. We've engaged with 60 chief psychological professions officers. These are the most senior psychological professional in each of the provider organizations across the country, NHS trusts and others. And um, there's a, a forum now within which these um, leaders are able to engage directly with policy teams to hear more about developments, have a dialogue about them. We also have a psychological professions network in every region in the country now, across seven regions. And a big shout out to my colleague Gita Bhutani, who's done an enormous amount to drive that, um, that change and that development. And we have a national psychological professions infrastructure at NHS England and Health Education England, which is um, uh, able to sort of take forward many of these developments that we're talking about. So where next with leadership? Well, we need the psychological professions networks to mature further in, uh, as regional professional leadership structures. We know there are different stages of development. Um, we would like to see them all sort of flourishing and uh, moving forward and taking up a pivotal and influential role. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a gap in some areas at the moment with psychological professionals involvement as clinical and professional leaders with integrated care systems or integrated care boards or components of these. So these are the structures that are um, supporting the, the kind of whole system development of health and care. And um, whilst there's an intention for there to be good, uh, strong multi-professional leadership uh, advising and um, supporting those developments, we know that psychological professionals aren't at the moment always around the table. They need to be. And on the left hand side of this slide, you'll see a paper that um, the PPN has produced, which is uh, on a related topic, but about psychological professions representation on mental health trust boards. It's a discussion paper. It's intended to support discussions around how could uh, board level leadership in trusts also be inclusive and um, uh, enable the voices of all uh, of the workforce, including psychological professionals who within mental health trusts are the second largest occupation. So diversify is next, the next theme within the workforce plan. And we've done a lot of work in this because we know we had a problem and um, that, that problem was that uh, our occupations taken as a whole weren't um, the most inclusive or appropriately um, welcoming of all talents or uh, and there were sort of systemic disadvantages for people from some backgrounds in, in entering our occupations so we have taken action we've worked with clinical psychology in particular where there was a, a particular issue um, we've implemented and invested in a nine-point action plan on ethnic minority inclusion across these training programs and um, many training programs have, have taken that forward very actively and effectively uh, we've also um, funded from Health Education England over 400 paid experience placements for disadvantaged psychology graduates who might otherwise not be able to 
um, find relevant experience uh, if they aspire to clinical psychology training. Um, and we funded also over 2,800 mentoring places for aspiring clinical psychologists from ethnic minority backgrounds. So a number of other areas here um, that where we've taken action, uh, child and adolescent psychotherapy, we've invested in over 60 preclinical bursaries. These were, um, uh, this is for funding of the preclinical training for child and adolescent, uh, aspiring child and adolescent psychotherapists. And, and again, targeting disadvantaged um, aspiring uh, individuals. And we've um, invested in a leadership mentoring scheme again for ethnic minority uh, aspiring leaders in the psychological professions, recognizing that there was an imbalance that at the higher ends of our occupations, uh, the higher grades, the um, ethnic diversity was much lower than at the lower grades. So we've been supporting that through that scheme. And within IACT, we've supported the implementation of the Ethnic Minority Positive Practice Guide, which has been, um, I think, a very, uh, very influential document. And I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But I want to focus in for a minute on representation by ethnicity in clinical psychology training, because this has been a big and contentious and difficult topic. It's an area where we know we've needed to make change. And um, of course, I should preface this by saying representation isn't everything. That's not the only thing we're interested in. We're interested in inclusion, which is a much wider issue. And we're interested in inclusion across all protected characteristics. But here's an area of focus. So if we look at the left hand side of this graph, you'll see the ethnic mix of NHS clinical psychologists in 2019. And the second bar is the England and Wales population the uh, 2011's latest census survey available. I think the, uh, the new census is out very, very shortly. Um, but what you'll see here is a, is a mismatch. So the ethnic diversity of the clinical psychology population being uh, less than the England and Wales population, ethnic minorities underrepresented. For this reason, we needed to um, support action. Um, but of course, just reaching that sort of level of representation for the England Wales population wouldn't be the only goal. Um, it's also reasonable to look at what's the ethnic minority population in UK undergraduate psychology courses. These are after all the feeder routes for every, um, nearly everybody entering clinical psychology training. And you'll see here a, a much um, uh, greater representation of ethnic minorities and an even bigger gap from where the NHS clinical psychology population is. Of course, uh, you might also compare to other um, professional um, training routes, UK undergraduate medicine, which offers a very different and more certain career path, um, sees an ethnic mix more like this. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's possible to see exactly what might be, uh, what might be achievable according to these other comparators. So there was work to do. Um, a lot of people have worked very hard and I do think there's some good news and the good news is here on the right hand side of the graph. So if you look at the entrance coming into clinical psychology training, you'll see things are changing. Um, the uh, representation of ethnic minorities in that uh, pool of entrance is increasing. It's increased consistently over the past three intakes. And you'll see, in fact, now in the 2021 intake, quite a close match between the clinical psychology trainee entry and the UK undergraduate um, population. Uh, Asian groups still somewhat underrepresented, which might point us towards some targeted action needed there. So it's, a, it's an enormous sort of thank you and um, uh, support to those who have made enormous sort of uh, uh, push on this to make this difference happen. But of course, this isn't the whole story. Um, what though it is also apparent is that there has been a shift in the application success rate across ethnicity. So again, looking back to 2019, um, you'll see that uh, you were much less likely to get in if you were from one of the Asian or black um, ethnicities. Uh, whereas if you look at the 2021 data from the clearinghouse, you'll see that for the first time, the um, 
black ethnicities are equally likely to succeed in their applications as the white applicants. Um, other groups still lagging a bit behind, uh, so more work to be done. Uh, but I think it's, it's testament to all the hard work that's gone in. Of course, I want to say presence is not the same as representation, is not the same as safety for those coming in from minority groups into um, our occupations. And the ACP UK document uh, that was recently published, I think, is really worth a read on this to um, highlight the experiences of those entering our occupations from minority backgrounds and tells us something about where, where we still need to head. And of course, that more ethnically diverse intake will also take some time to work through in terms of the overall population of clinical psychologists. OK, so. Um, a second sort of caveat to this is that a representative workforce, even if and when we achieve that, doesn't necessarily guarantee that health inequalities are addressed successfully. It's a, an important stepping stone, but it doesn't guarantee it. And, and this, I think, illustrates that point. So if we look at the IAPT workforce, um, we see that there's a very close match between the ethnicity of IAPT employees, uh, clinical employees, uh, in the left-hand pie chart and the ethnicity of the England Wales population. So really close match. And this has been more or less identical since 2015. So it's not that this has changed. And yet we know that through systematic collation of outcome data by ethnicity, many of the ethnic minorities have um, been underserved by IAPT, both in terms of access and also in um, not being supported to achieve equivalent outcomes uh, and recovery rates as white ethnicities. Well, there was a huge amount of work by many people went into addressing this problem. This includes the publication of the Improving Access to Psychological Therapies Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Service User Positive Practice Guide. And um, it's a uh, huge thanks to Andrew Beck, Saik and Naz, the other authors and the British Association for Behavioural and Cognitive Psychotherapies for pushing this forward in such a um, positive, constructive and persistent way. There's some good news, which is that over time, things have changed. So the blue lines on this bar relate to each of the ethnicities entering um, IAP treatment in 2015-16, and the orange bars relate to those entering treatment in 2021-22. And these, this shows the recovery rates achieved so you'll see on the right hand side um, that uh, in, in the last full year of data, we see the recovery rate achieved for all of the white ethnicities. Um, and very close to it, even back in 2015. Back in 2015, though, all of the other ethnicities under uh, were underserved in terms of achieving these outcomes um, in their IAPT interventions, whereas now um, you can see that there's been a really significant shift for some groups. So uh, ethnic minorities have uh, outcomes have improved significantly more than the outcomes for uh, the white groups, but also um, African, Caribbean, Indian and Chinese now also meet the recovery target for IAPT. Now, there's further to go, isn't there? So you can see immediately from this that there are some um, areas that need significant further attention, particularly um, in the Asian grouping, uh, Bangladeshi and Pakistani individuals particularly. And um, so this points us towards where more work needs to be done. So I'll move us along because there is more to do, quite obviously, as I've just highlighted there. We need to maintain and extend the gains around um, diversifying. We need to uh, evaluate the impact further and adapt the investment that's been made so far. And we need to extend this work across all psychological professions and all protected characteristics. We've had a particular single minded focus on ethnicity, but there's much more we can do across other protected characteristics, too. We've had a focus on um, clinical psychology and child psychotherapy, but we need to ex expand that focus across the other groups. So the final area of the plan is transform 
And this is about uh, boldly innovating and improving in, uh, in accordance with evidence. And these are some of the things that we've been able to take forward. I mentioned earlier the new national curricula for a number of nice guided therapies. Um, we've also um, support clinical psychology courses that wanted to develop dual accredited training pathways um, so that they could uh, trainees could graduate through those pathways, being able to demonstrate a multi-professional marker of competence in a therapy. Um, and we thought this was very important in order to support the integration of the psychological professions, the, the working together so that um, those, those markers were shared. Um, the second uh, sort of uh, mid blue point there, the routine collection and publication of patient reported outcome measures, I think is really important because uh, through adopting this principle ac across psychological therapies expansion, it's probably one of the big, biggest single interventions we can make that will demonstrate um, impact and value and support future investment. Uh, but of course, it's also something that in many forms of therapy is seen as integral and useful to the therapeutic process. And the final point here is um, a, a project around the employment of health psychologists, which is a really sort of um, valuable um, innovation, I think. And this is to support projects around service transformation. Uh, so there will be a health psychologist trainee employed in each of the seven regions. Uh, to support a service transformation project or projects. And uh, you'll no doubt be hearing more about that uh, in due course. But I just wanted to uh, highlight where we are with those dual accredited pathways. So we invited clinical psychology courses uh, to apply for additional funding um, if they wanted to develop pathways for um, uh, BABCP, that's British Association of Behavioural and Cognitive Psychotherapies, uh, accreditation for a training pathway in CBT, cognitive therapy. And we also invited them to apply if they wanted to invest in developing a systemic practice pathway accredited by the Association of Family Therapists. And um, this is where that's got to. So prior to 2022, there were five of these CBT pathways across the country. There was one systemic practice pathway. After 2023, plans are in place that there would be 21 um, CBT pathways across the country in different programs out of the 27 and 16 systemic practice pathways. This isn't about creating a monoculture. It's about um, supporting individuals who uh, want to, to develop those particular markers of competence that we think will help them to um, uh, make effective contributions multi-professionally in various parts of the service. So next on transform, well, I think I, I referred to the outcome measurement earlier. I do think routine outcome measurement across psychological therapies expansion is still something that needs to be further embedded um, and can really support the further growth and investment. We need better recognition of registrations um, and better public information about the psychological professions. It's a minefield and um, finding uh, a practitioner who has the qualifications to deliver a particular form of uh, psychological activity uh, is, is really complex and it needs to be, I think, simpler and more transparent. So um, we're looking at what more work needs to be done on that. We're going to be undertaking a review of best practice in blended learning for the psychological profession. So we've seen over the period of the pandemic um, that by necessity and with great effectiveness, many programs of learning for the psychological professions moved entirely to remote delivery. And um, in those extreme circumstances, it's incredible what was achieved. But now, of course, we can look back, learn from that and um, review what worked best, what wasn't so effective, what do you need in terms of an in-person content to the training? Um, particularly because we're training practitioners to deliver um, psychological ways of working in person, as well as sometimes remotely. Um, but much of what will be delivered in the future will be in person. So, um, so we need to have an in-person component. We'll be launching that review during next year. And 
physical health care, the contribution of psychological professions into physical health care, I have described it as the next frontier. Obviously, many are over that frontier already and already um, doing great work in that area, but there's much, much more we can do. So that brings me to the end of the five areas of the workforce plan and a bit of an assessment of where I think we are and where we might develop next. Look out in the new year for the Intergalactic Bridge resource, which is going to launch. You're going to see um, the full clips from all of those uh, who were featured in the trailer today, but also many others. Um, and uh, that's, that's coming to the PPN website soon. I do believe that by pulling together across the psychological professions, policymakers and the public, we can continue to make a huge contribution to NHS commissioned healthcare and we need to continue that push. Times may be challenging, but that's the time when we need to maintain that push, I believe, because I do think the psychological professions and the expansion of the psychological professions can offer solutions at times of pressure. I really look forward to um, picking up the discussion on any of these points as we come to our panel discussion uh, a bit later in the session. But I'd like now to introduce Elsa Swarbrick, who is Head of Mental Health at, um, for Perinatal and Children and Young People at NHS England. And Elsa is um, co-chair with me of the uh, Psychological Professions Workforce Group that works across NHS England and Health Education England and policy lead for this um, area of psychological professions development. So Elsa, over to you for your concluding remarks. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. Um, and, and what a fantastic and wide ranging and incredibly rich presentation. Um, so you set out the vision um, and then in quite granular detail how sort of how we go about delivering against that vision, which I think is really, really important. So both plan, but then also the how with some wonderful examples of what's really happening already pardon me, on, on the ground. Um, so thank you to Adrian, and thank you to Amy, Josh and Ali, um, and thank you to everybody else who's been taking part, either by submitting um, answers on Slido, by doing the work, by doing some of the work that we saw on the Intergalactic Bridge, and, and all of you for, 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 for joining us today. Um, I, I mean, what's really striking is that it's an incredibly ambitious vision, um, and it's an ambitious set of plans too. Um, but it's it's also inspiring and it also feels transformative and I think that's what's that's what's really critical. So at NHS England we're certainly committed to supporting the development of, of, of this vision and these plans but what's what, what to me was really clear from today is that this isn't really for any one organisation to um, to deliver on their, their own and, 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 that, and it shouldn't be like that. Um, so it's, it's something which as Adrian has been saying involves everybody working together across all parts of the system to um, deliver and, and, and really grateful for everything that everybody who's tuned in today um, has been doing. Um, and it's also been um, great to hear more about today, just about how people have been working to do to, to do this work and about how the vision is translating into action. It's been really clear um, that um, from what you've to what you told us on Slido and also from what we've heard from Amy, Josh and Ali, that you're also committed to the vision and also to making it a reality. And I want to just pick out a few themes from what I've heard um, today. So um, the, the first very, very clear one was about collaboration. Um, so we talked about the whole system, we talked about people working together, we talked about the therapeutic alliance, um, and, and, and as I said earlier, it's, it, it's very clear that the way to move forward is, is, is through collaboration, through co-production, um, and um, through, through working together. The second theme which really came out very strongly, um, I think, is about, uh, I kind of very broadly would call it the whole person, um, or about inclusivity. Um, and that's whether we're talking about hearing the voice of patients and the voice of experts by experience, the voice of the public. Um, it's also about the, the, the interconnection, the interplay between mental and physical health. Um, and, and that came through very strongly as, as, as something that's, that's part of, of, of the work that, was, that Adrian set out today. Um, 
uh, the whole person also is about somebody. Um, I think it was it was um, Amy or, or, or Ali said very early on in, in in the session about seeing somebody as a precious individual, and I think that's kind of at the heart of of, of some of this work. It's about humanity, isn't it? Um, and, and 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 about sort of seeing seeing the whole and the the whole person and the individual person. Um, so so yes, yeah, so a theme about inclusivity, about about um, the whole person, and of course, as part of that, we heard about all the data about and uh, the particularly the, some of the some of the green shoots around some of the data that Adrian was showing about inclusivity in particular, um, and, and then finally, a really strong theme I think was about action and about moving into action, moving from a vision, from plans into actually what's happening on the ground. It's very, very clear that some of the, some of the, that a lot of work is, is taking place already, that a lot has already been achieved. Um, and, and of course, and as Adrian also said, it's really important that that's evidenced. Um, and that's, that's evidenced very, very good data, um, both about the people that we're working with, but also about the outcomes that they're achieving so that we're able to think about how we can do more and how, how we can learn from what we've been doing so far and iterate and finally transform as we go. Um, so so um, I think the, the final word on, on kind of the themes really that sums up for me on action and in particular was, was um, the, uh, on, on the Intergalactic Bridge video. Um, somebody said it can be done and I think that applies to, 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 to all of this work um, through working together, through taking very clear action, through evidencing what we do, um, and, and moving moving forward. So, so, so finally, just to say a huge thanks, um, a huge thanks to all those who've spoken, to those who've taken part, and to those who've given up their time to join online. Um, and I'm really looking forward to being here next year um, and to seeing what more has been done over the course of this year and how more of those plans have been turned into action. So, so thank you very much. Um, and Adrian, I think we're now moving into a Q&A, aren't we? Great. Well, just to add my thanks to the panel um, and all speakers, it's fantastic to have us all together for this part of the session. Jacelyn, thank you for agreeing to convene this and uh, um, uh, sort out which questions you, you think are um, the most popular for ans answering and discussion. I hope we can make this a discussion. I also just wanted to mention before we get into that, that the um, video that Amy and Josh and Ali made is uh, there's a bit of bonus content that we're going to share after the session. It's actually about there's about 17 minutes of it altogether and uh, definitely some other elements that are well worth a listen and a watch. So we'll share that as part of the resources. So Jesslyn, back to you. Thanks, Adrian. Um, and just first of all, to apologise to everyone, as I, I am going to be looking off to the side slightly just to read the questions as I'm as I'm asking them. Um, so I think the first one to start with um, was a, a one that just came in towards the end here. Is there any way that we can get more involved with the PPN or service improvements as a combined expert by experience or rec recent psychology graduate? Uh, so perhaps, uh, Adrian, if I start with you and then I can open up to the experts by experience on their thoughts around how to get involved. Sure. Thanks, Jason. So first thing to say is um, the Psychological Professions Network is open to all to join. Be you a member of the public, a psychological professional, um, policymaker, or anyone with an interest in psychological health care. So do join your regional Psychological Professions Network wherever you are. Um, and I think through that, you can perhaps get a bit of a picture of what's happening in your area and around some of these developments and how you might be able to contribute and engage. Um, each psychological professions network um, sends out regular communications. There are forums that you can get involved in. Um, you, there are usually a number of different opportunities to, um, to make a contribution. So this will involve all of us working together. Those networks are a great way of doing that. They also do have experts by experience involved in each of them. And so that's one way of getting involved. Um, but I'm sure Ali, Josh, Amy might want to add in terms of other ways of getting involved in some of these developments. I'd just like to say, um, on, honestly, please get in touch. Um, find your regional um, psychological professions network. Um, I'm in the North uh, West. We are always delighted to hear from you. Um, I write a blog each month, um, you know, 
please um, follow me, uh, contact um, the group at any time. And if there's anything that we can do to help you and, and um, progress you on your journey, uh, we would be delighted to help you. Can I can I just ask Ali just just to say how would people get in touch? How will people find um, their local or regional groups? Um, if you would like to follow any links that you've got at the end uh, on the screen, um, you will get to the Psychological Professions Network and you will be able to identify your own um, regional network. Yeah, I would say in, in terms of getting involved with um, any kind of um, expert by experience work or public work, um, then um, again, you know, if you, if you find any of these networks, but I would say um, start small um, and um, uh, find out what's going on in your area, use your lived experience, um, and also be aware that uh, learning about uh, the healthcare profession uh, and how systems work is going to help you to be able to make your voice more meaningful as you build relationships um, and as time goes by um, you will uh, find out more want to get more involved and there are different levels of involvement as well from from perhaps just turning up and, and giving some opinions to then uh, getting really stuck into things developing more training and um, helping more strategically um, and uh, going from there Josh, anything to add from a young person's perspective in, in getting involved? Yeah, I mean, working with experts by experience is a, a bit of a strange um, process, isn't it? Because you're taking everything that you're used to, working with the hierarchy, um, you know, the most imp important person kind of has the, the most influence and, and turning that upside down slightly listening to you know the service users and um others who have been on the, re the receiving end of that care and and giving them some say as opposed to maybe the commissioners or decision makers who um affect change but don't kind of have to live with those consequences in terms of young people specifically and working with them as ebes i'd say um again it's kind of a slight culture shift in the way of doing things rather than inviting young people kind of into meetings and trying to bring them up to speed on the jargon the minutes the the strict kind of agenda and format it's about almost kind of percolating down what you're already doing and meeting young people where they are making it fun making it engaging and um yeah just helping them understand that they can have influence and um yeah, that, that they can make changes as well. Just add here that um, almost at the start of the session today, um, Debbie used a phrase, it was, um, let's, keeping, let's keep working together to transform lives. And I think that's really the work that we can all do together. We can all, as EBEs, uh, experts by experience, people with lived experience, um, together our voices can affect change for the better. And um, working together as we are today here, um, it's that transformational element which um, really carries us all forward. So, yes, please do get in touch. Thank you. One of the next questions that we've got coming through is around um, retention and how we keep our people working uh, our psychological professions working in the NHS, but also looking after them while they are working. Uh, Alza, I wonder if you would like to start with this particular question around how do we keep our psychological professions and keep the retention high? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the presentation that we've seen today has shown clearly enormous growth, first of all, in, in the psychological professions, um, which is, is, is fantastic um, to see, really rapid growth. But, but clearly, we recognise that, that staffing remains under, under lots of pressure um, and that we do need to do more to make sure that we improve retention for people who've, who, who are joining 
psychological professions. Um, and and then there's, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's work that's underway to address that. There's a, uh, a, a workforce task and a retention task and finish group, which is, is, is looking at some of the root causes and how we might be able to address those things over time. And, and I also thought it was helpful just to give a few examples as well of, of, of where we've been trying to collectively trying to think of, of how we might improve um, people's view of, of what it would be like to stay in the psychological professions in particular. So, um, so for example, for um, child wellbeing practitioners and education mental health practitioners, we've been facilitating improved career progression with more developed senior roles um, through, th through professional registration. So make, making the psychological professions and the new roles in particular um, a, 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 a kind of a long-term a, a long plan, I suppose, if you, if, if, if you like, so somewhere where people feel that they've got a future. And I think that's the kind of thing that's really, really important, as well as looking after our staff. Thanks, Elsa. Adrian, did you want to come in? Yeah, a couple of things. Um... I mean, I think Elsa's covered some really important elements. I think the data shows that the most significant factor that causes people to leave their job is their relationship with their manager. And what um, that suggests to me is that leadership plays a really important component in retaining people and getting leadership right. I do think supporting psychological professionals as leaders can make a really important contribution and that means leaders, not just as sort of managers and professional managers of, of, of other psychological professionals, but also leaders in the system that can create a sort of um, best possible uh, environment within which people can work despite of pressures. Pressure doesn't always lead to lots of people leaving. Sometimes pressure can be something that is... Um, uh, when managed well, a source of pride for a team and can lead to the team working really well together, knowing clearly what their roles are and how they are making a contribution. I think bringing more of that psychological approach to leadership can, can perhaps make a, an important contribution. We know that psychological professionals have also, over the period of COVID, made a really important contribution to staff wellbeing through the staff wellbeing hubs that have been um, launched around the country. And so I think we need to see that sort of work continuing um, so that that, that, uh, that support to enabling people's well-being, both in a proactive way and when they get in trouble um, in terms of well-being, uh, can be taken forward. Um, I think careers is the other aspect. So we know that people of different generations see careers quite differently to one another. Um, there are many who would now think more about a portfolio career or multiple stages in a career journey. We need to make those stages more transparent and easily navigable, I think, in the psychological professions. And we need those routes to all of the psychological occupations being able to progress without necessarily having to leave their occupation and train in another one. Thanks, Adrian. Amy? That, that's really... Um really helpful um, in terms of retention as well. I would say um, as working as an expert by experience, um, we also, um, in order to retain experts by experience, the, the, there needs to be quite a lot of thought about how, how we're, our pathways are also kind of developed and encouraged as well. Um, and, and the well-being of, around the experts by experience, because Quite often we can be working um, for several organisations at once and have no way over, like you say, a team manager. Um, it, my, my personal experience is that working for lots of different organisations and nobody overall is, is sort of checking what I'm doing or um, if I'm OK. Um, uh, and also there's, there is that sense of progression from being someone who will just come and talk about their lived experience to somebody who can then actually help influence policy. Um, and also the fact that um, in, in order to retain your clinical um, psychologists and, and all the other professions around that, um, to be able to use people like us who can actually support them to do some of the, the less clinical roles, to, to take that kind of feel like the spade work that goes around the job, um, using people with lived experience can actually help to, to um to come in to those gaps where there are gaps where we're saying we can't there aren't enough people coming forward how can we support those roles 
a bit more creatively around that. So a way of sort of helping to uh, keep the the workforce going, and that's that's another way of, of uh, kind of thinking creatively around that and using people like us. Uh, and we have the the obviously the uh, bonus of having lived experience. <laughs> so just some thoughts Thanks, on that. Amy. Thanks, Amy. Um, did anyone else want to come in, or I'll move on to the next question? So there's there's another theme around a few questions that are coming at, coming through uh, about sort of widening participation. Uh, so looking at what's being addressed to um, done to address part time training, um, enabling people from uh, um, equality, diversity, or inclusion sort of minority ethnic, ethnicities accessing going beyond what you've described has happened so far what is the plan going forward to try and tackle widening participation and, and increasing access so um adrian if i come to you for that one first oh yeah sure um so i think as i started to allude to in the presentation we have had some sort of really targeted focused areas for action on inclusion and we've been particularly focused on um, supporting greater inclusion around ethnicity and particularly where we've seen problems for particular professions. Um, but we know there are other problems too. So I think it is about getting the sort of diagnosis or the formulation right and then designing interventions that can, can tackle those particular difficulties. Another um, problem area we know is that the um, sort of top gradings within our professions, um, there are a far lower proportion of women than there are in the lower graded elements of our professions. So we need to understand the barriers um, and put in place um, supportive solutions to address the imbalance. Um, you know, we, we also know that, you know, looking at the data I presented, you've got a uh, psychological therapies workforce that is much more um, diverse than the psychology workforce and yet the, there are not the same routes for progression for psychological therapists as there are for psychologists that needs to be addressed and that will have an impact on then the diversity of senior leaders so there's a number of areas i think we will be sort of focusing on and picking up um, but you know i think as i also tried to set out this isn't the responsibility of any one agency or part of the system we all need to be making um, changes, examining our own behaviours, examining our own um, attitudes and assumptions, and uh, and making sure that that we're all pushing for that greater inclusion across the professions. Thanks, Adrian. Did anyone else want to come in on that? Elsa, did you have any thoughts? No. Okay. I think Adrian summed it up beautifully. Uh, I am just aware of the time and uh, we're at two minutes two now there are a lot of questions and i appreciate we haven't been able to address all of them so i do apologize for for that um if we have one last question if that's okay for each of the experts by experience if you wanted to change one thing or we'll give one piece of advice what would that be can i just say it's probably echoing um what adrian said um, you know, so eloquently um, during the morning, but it's just make all healthcare psychological. It's absolutely vital. Um, it's vital for service users to um, make good recoveries, um, to navigate um, physical healthcare with mental health um, needs. And yeah, it's that transformation of making all healthcare psychological. Um, I would say, like, like I alluded to before, for, for me, the, the single biggest, biggest change I would love to see in healthcare is that um, lived experience um, is embedded in absolutely everything, um, whether it's um, um, asking, you know, how you felt about your care or whether it's actually being involved right at the top um, on the strategy that every single department, every single project has lived experience involvement, and that the that lived people with lived experience are again have have good support training 
pathways so that they can be really engaged meaningfully. Um, um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's evidence, so much evidence out there that shows that that bit of investment, um, it, it multiplies itself in the output um, with projects that, that have been successful and really do, as Elsa said, you know, transform things. Um, and that's a bit of courage needed from uh, people at the top to say, let's go through this. It might be, this might be a, uh, a risk on the other hand, um, we see, you know, like we see, we need to recruit over 10,000 psychologists. But if we can't do that, how can we, how can we be creative again around those roles? How can we um, support people to do that job? And there's people with lived experience who are really keen to be able to help. And so if we can really engage them and support them and um, employ them in a, a way that's going to be as supportive as it is for other staff, that would be my dream. Thanks, Amy. Um, just before Adrian wraps up, Josh, anything from you? Oh, very briefly. Um, I would love to see more opportunities for service user involvement and um, participation being facilitated, um, spread more widely across the country, across different organisations, as long as it's done well. And it's very rarely that it isn't. Um, it can be life changing for everyone involved. Thanks, Josh. And Adrian, over to you. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you very much to all of our speakers and contributors today. Debbie, Amy, Josh, Ali, Elza. Thank you, Jocelyn, for convening so successfully this panel session. And thanks to all of those behind the scenes. Um, Polly, Steve, our wonderful interpreters. Thank you. Please do uh, Look at the programme for the rest of the week, see what you can make time for to um, join us in. And I think within the Slido, you'll see some evaluation questions now about this session. We'd really value your feedback on it um, so that we can continue to improve. Um, enjoy the rest of today. Um, this afternoon, there's another session that you may wish to join and uh, that is specifically focusing on expert by experience involvement and the impact. So um, we hope to see many of you there and across the rest of the week. Thank you very much.